Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on the intersection of opioid abuse, overdose, and suicide, and understanding those connections. It's our pleasure to be here with you today. This is a webinar that is co-hosted by the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, or SPRC, and the CAPT, or the Center for the Application of Prevention Technologies both from within SAMHSA. We are really excited to be here with you all today and are grateful you all are joining us. My name is Gazela Rotz. I'm a part of the Center for the Application of Prevention Technologies. So we've got some, some presenters to be here with you who are quite knowledgeable and I'm really looking forward to getting to engage in this information with you. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Richard McKeon to start us off. Thank you so much. And I would like to welcome everybody to this important webinar on behalf of SAMHSA and specifically of, from both the uh, Center for Mental Health Services at SAMHSA, uh, who provides the funding for the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and for the Center for Substance Abuse uh, Prevention, who provides the funding for the CAPT. I think it's particularly important that we are working together on this critical issue that has so many implications for, uh, for Americans. So I said that this work is supported through both the SPRC and the CAB, and for the presentations both from them as well as from those of us who are federal officials, what the views that are expressed don't necessarily express the policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, and so facilitators, in addition to myself today, um, is uh, Carol, Dr. Carol McHale, who is the Senior Social Science Analyst at the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. And I am now going to turn it over to Carol. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our three presenters today, one of whom has been chatting since the beginning with you, Gisela Roth. But let me start out with Dr. Alex Crosby, who is a senior medical advisor in the Division of Violence Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, an expert in the epidemiology and prevention of suicidal behavior in community prevention services, Dr. Crosby conducts descriptive and analytic research and assists communities on the prevention of self-directed violence. He is also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Next, we have Dr. Kristen Quinlan, who is a senior research associate at Education Development Center which is the host organization for both the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and the Center for the Application of Prevention Technologies. Dr. Quinlan serves as epidemiologist for SAMHSA's Suicide Prevention Resource Center. In this role, she works across state suicide prevention systems to build their evaluation capacity and infrastructure for data collection and assist states in locating and analyzing existing data. Dr. Quinlan has conducted multiple literature reviews examining factors that contribute to the non-medical use of prescription drugs, including opioids, and the effective strategies to address this problem. And then we have Gazela Ross. Ms. Ross is the coordinator for the Northeast Resource Team of SAMHSA's Center for the Application of Prevention Technologies, or the CAPT, as it is commonly known. In this role, she is responsible for managing and supervising the delivery of training and technical assistance to the 11 states comprising the Northeast service area. Ms. Roth has extensive experience providing technical assistance to communities and community coalitions on developing cross-sector partnerships to address important prevention issues, including underage drinking, opioid overdose, and youth marijuana use. A seasoned prevention practitioner, Ms. Roth makes connections between research content and pre the prevention work that is underway in the field, and she will discuss these connections at key points throughout the webinar today. 
We have three objectives to cover today with our presentation and that the three presenters will be addressing throughout. The first is to describe the relationship between opioid use disorder and suicidality. The second is to define action steps for accessing state, tribe, jurisdiction, and community level data on suicidal behaviors, opioid abuse, and overdose. And the third is to identify populations at increased risk for overdose and suicide death and the factors that contribute to these risks. And with this, I'll hand it back over to Gisela. Thank you so much, both Dr. McKeon and Dr. McHale, for that introduction and uh, for welcoming us today. Really appreciate that. So we're going to go back, um, but I, what I'd like you to, 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 to think about right now is whether there are any other questions you'd like to see answered today, kind of knowing what Dr. McHale just presented in terms of objectives, just invite you to share with us any, anything that, that's kind of on your mind. I also just want to put a little pin in your, your mind. Um, you may have seen this in the initial registration that this is actually part of a two-part webinar series, um, and we are planning that follow-up webinar focusing on the issue of chronic pain in the intersection of, of suicide and opioids. Um, so you will be hearing from us about that soon. Be on the lookout for it. And with that, I would like to actually pass this over uh, to Dr. Alex Crosby, who's going to walk us through existing data sources at the national and community level on opioid abuse, overdose, and suicide. And then at the end of the section, and, and Dr. McHale alluded to this, I'll be coming back in actually at the end of every section to talk about um, some of those practical implications for our work at the, at the community level. So uh, Alex, can I hand it over to you? Yes, you may, and, and I wanted to uh, welcome all of those who are participating in the, the webinar today. And as uh, was mentioned, what I'll start off doing is kind of giving you a picture of the description of the patterns of national and local data on opioid abuse, overdose, and suicide. And, and while there are many different ways in which we can illustrate you know, what those patterns are. Um, there's different aspects of the data from talking about uh, data that deal with the deaths due to these uh, particular adverse conditions. What about those that are hospitalized, um, those that might visit emergency departments, hospital emergency departments due to uh, opioid overdose or suicide attempts, uh, along with those uh, where you can describe what happens when you ask on surveys. So we'll give you some examples of, of all of those different kinds of uh, data and, and let you see which ones might be useful. One of the things to start off with is data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And from um, the data from 2016, it, it shows that almost 12 million people uh, over the age of 12 abused opioids in that particular year when they asked them about in the past 12 months, um, have you abused opioids? About 11.5 million, the majority of that uh, 12 million, uh, abused prescription over opioids, and that's uh, almost 97% of all those people who, have, who abused opioids. One of the other things about it is to try to take a look at some of the different ways in which this manifests itself. And you can see that there were almost a million that used heroin as uh, one aspect of the opioid misuse that they had. And that's about 8% of all of those that misused opioids. One of the other parts of this problem is that there are many that abuse more than one type of substance. And you can see here that over half a million, over 641,000 used opioids and abused prescription opioids. So you've got about 5.4% 4, 4 of folks um, also abusing those kind of drugs too. Another way of showing what this problem looks like is using a pyramid. And, and what the pyramid does is it gives us an opportunity to kind of look at opportunities for intervention and then also gives us an example of kind of what the magnitude of the problem is. Um, utilizing several different data sources, um, we can look at adults from 2016 and give a picture of what was going on in regards to suicidal behavior, suicide thoughts, as well as deaths due to suicide. Uh, during um, 2016, when we were asked in that uh, question from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, in the past 12 months, 
you know, how many of you have seriously considered suicide, you see that there was almost 10 million adults said that they had serious thoughts of suicide. That's about 4% of all adults in the United States. About 1.3 million mentioned that they had made a suicide attempt in the past 12 months. Generally, that's about one out of every 200 adults in the United States. And then there were about 45,000 deaths due to suicide in that the year of 2016. That's a suicide about every 12 minutes in the United States. That gives us an idea about what the magnitude of the problem is, but it also gives us an idea about where there may be opportunities for intervention. Given that there are about 9.8 million adults that seriously considered suicide, but yet only 1.3 million that engaged in suicidal behavior, there's a lot of opportunity to work with those 9 million, that 9.8 million, to try to prevent them from moving on to suicide attempts, and from that 1.3 million to the 45,000 um, that died as a result of suicide, trying to prevent those that engage in suicidal behavior and those non-fatal suicide attempts from moving on to the fatalities. It's important for us to prevent fatalities, but also important to look at those risk factors, those that have thought about suicide, those who have engaged in suicidal behavior, and try to prevent them from moving on to more serious or more lethal aspects. Another data system that I'll give you an example from is the National Violent Death Reporting System. This is data from 2015 um, that describes the patterns of suicide um, for the 27 states that reported all of the deaths of, due to suicide in their state. One of the things to see here is that about 50% of the suicides were uh, a firearm was the mechanism I would like for you to focus just for a minute on those 15%, so about one out of every seven in which poisoning was deemed to be the mechanism of death. Of those that died as a result of poisoning suicides, you can see that about a third of those opioids were considered the main cause of death, but also noted that there are other forms of um, chemicals that are also found and other substances that are also found in those, from antidepressants to benzodiazepines to antipsychotics, and that oftentimes with those that die as a result of poisoning overdoses as well as other um, leading mechanisms, that oftentimes there are multiple substances that may be involved in, in those forms of death. This bar chart gives you an example that suicidal behavior, that alcohol-related substance abuse, that drug-related substance abuse in terms of causes of death affect all populations. So whether you're talking about Native American, non-Hispanics, white non-Hispanics, African American non-Hispanics, or Asian and Pacific Islanders, it affects all of those populations. It manifests itself differently in these different populations, but it's important to note that it affects everybody. You know, whether you're talking about different age groups, whether you're talking about different communities, whether you're talking about urban or rural populations, that all communities are affected in some form or fashion. Um, you can see in different uh, populations that alcohol-related deaths might be the, the largest portion. In other populations, it might be overdose-related deaths in terms of prescription or drug-related overdose. And in other populations, it might be suicides, but it affects all of them. This trend line just demonstrates that, especially when you look at suicides in the purple, um, that rates have been increasing since the year 2000, steadily all the way up to 2016, and that when you look at unintentional drug overdose poisonings in the yellow, that rates have been increasing since the year 2000 and especially have increased since about 2012. So while many other of the major leading causes of death, especially the top 10 causes of death in the United States, have been decreasing, uh, heart disease, cancer, um, stroke, all of those have been coming down. These two have been increasing, and in, also in relation to looking at some of the other forms of injury-related deaths, that some have been dropping, but these two have definitely been increasing. There are different sources of data, and there will also be handouts that are available to you um, for you to, to download that you can access some of this data that might look at the national data, might look at the data for your state, 
or in some cases may also have locally available information. Uh, along the first row, web-based injury statistics query and reporting system, also called Whiskers, which is available on CDC's website, uh, that includes fatal as well as non-fatal data, that you can look at opioid abuse deaths as well as suicides, and then also non-fatal uh, suicide attempts. The second row, um, National Violent Death Reporting System, which currently is available in 40 states plus uh, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. We got uh, word that probably by the end of this year, we ought to be able to expand that system to cover all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico, and that includes information about suicides as well as the circumstances uh, that were precipitating those suicides. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which collects information about adults, includes information about opioid abuse and about suicide attempts and about suicidal ideation. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, the next to last row there, that includes information about high school students that does ask questions about substance abuse, about suicide attempts, and also about um, suicidal thoughts. And then a new system that we're now developing and providing uh, information for is the Biosense platform, or Essence, which uh, provides real-time data on hospital emergency department visits uh, across a number of different entities, uh, including substance abuse, including suicide and suicide attempts. At this point, um, I'll turn back over to Gisela, and we will talk a little bit more about some of the implications and give some examples. Thank you very much. Oh, Alex, thank you so much. That was an incredible amount of data. Um, I just want to step, take a step back for a moment, because I think one of the things that you all will notice is that today we are um, we're going to be focusing a lot on data. So we just kind of presented some national data. Um, Alex showed you kind of this, this other handout we have that identifies different kinds of data sources and how you can break them down. But kind of, again, to, to take a step back and, and, and talk about kind of this data, this data collection piece, uh, collaboration and partnership building, these are two pieces we're really going to focus on heavily today. Um, and, and just to explain why, and I'm sure many of you as community level uh, prevention practitioners know and understand the importance of this, right? But we have to make sure that we're collecting data that is relevant and that helps us to identify what the priority problems in, in each of our communities are, and then to think about the specific community context in which we're operating um, so that if it's relevant, we can then identify the appropriate kinds of evidence-based programs um, that we could be implementing um, if we need to address, for example, suicide and, and opioids specifically. We understand these are, you know, both suicide and opioids are certainly big concerns for so many communities in our country, but not for each and every community. So I just want to, you know, to not be too fatalistic about that. Sorry, that's probably not the right word, but just to kind of put that caution out there, it's important for us to go back and really look at our community level data um, so that we really know what we're, what we're working with. So when we're thinking about that data piece, um, for if I'm a community level prevention practitioner, um, either working on suicide prevention or substance abuse prevention, I want to be able to step back and identify what kind of community level data I have um, that assesses cause of death. So do I have anything related to medical examiner data? What might my youth health survey tell me about both kind of uh, suicidal thoughts and ideation, um, any substance misuse and those kinds of things. So I want to make sure that I know what kind of community level data I have. Then I want to be able to look for both kind of the method of suicide and the presence of opioids. Um, and that can look a little bit different. That might, again, that might involve some information from medical examiners or coroners um, and, and toxicologists, right? Then I want to take a step back and look at to see how my community data compares to the national and state data. Is it completely different? Is it on track? What does that mean for how I might need to be able to respond? And based on all of that, then I want to really identify partners who I might want to approach for qualitative data, right? So key stakeholder interviews or focus groups. 
And that will hopefully then lead me to a place where I might understand better which populations are most at risk in my particular community. Um, so I just, Alex, if I can just kind of softball a question to you. Um, if you're thinking about this process at the community level, which kind of partners might you be looking for us to reach out to to try to kind of engage in this and get some additional um, data from? I, I think there are a number of different partners that would be interested and willing to participate in terms of the, the efforts to try to address uh, both of these two problems. And, you know, there might be one way of trying to think about kind of two big categories of, of partners. One might be those partners that might have data and, and data providers, you know, from, as you mentioned, you know, maybe medical examiners or coroners that would have information about um, death data. There might be some ability to uh, collaborate with those that work in the areas of social services, you know, whether it's the Department of Family and Children's Services, and depending on, you know, different states may have different names, but understanding that those uh, kind of organizations may have information about those that may have had trouble with, with some of the different areas. Uh, substance abuse, you know, whether it's uh, clinics or hospitals or other kinds of organizations that might have that kind of information. Uh, law enforcement uh, may also have information in terms of providing data. And oftentimes in working with those organizations, you'll find that, you know, some organizations have some bits of uh, the puzzle and other organizations have other parts of the puzzle. And by putting those together, a better coordinated effort to identify, you know, where are the vulnerable populations, where are the at-risk um, communities might be uh, better able to, uh, to work together. The other big category in terms of looking at who might be some of the stakeholders would also be those organizations that are involved more in the prevention aspect. And so they may also have information about you know, services that they can provide, those kind of uh, folks that they have seen um, as part of their clients or patients, that they may be able to provide information, not only the data, but then also, you know, capacity for being able to work with some of these groups that might be at risk, and then also how that there might be some needs within the community that are unmet, and that by working together and collaborating with some of these different organizations, we might be able to do more than just one organization by itself. One of the other things that I wanted to mention too, and as you talked about identifying community level data sources to assess the causes of death, mortality is an, an important aspect to try to take a look at. What do we know about those that have died as a result of uh, overdose or those that have died as a result of suicide and trying to understand the risk factors that we might be able to address? It also may be important to identify, as we talked about, some of those that have been affected but have not died, you know, the non-fatal injuries, the, um, the overdoses that uh, were able to be treated and, and, and not lead to a fatality, because that kind of information is also useful in identifying those populations where we may be able to intervene before a worse tragedy occurs. That is super helpful. Thank you so much, Alex. I, I think especially kind of as you help us to think through kind of how do you build capacity, right? And so thinking about those organizations we can partner with and what that means for our capacity as well as the, the needs that are being met and those are, that are not being met and thinking about risk factors, which um, I know we'll be talking a little bit more about in just a few minutes. So thank you so much. That was, that was really helpful. In the meantime, I am going to keep us going um, because we we actually have an example from the field that I just want to, you know, kind of share with you all because I think it's, it's helpful. So we're taking this example from the state of Rhode Island, and they actually have gone back and tested all those who uh, died of suicide death, so for specifically looking at anyone who is 25 and older, and have tested those for opioids. Uh, in September 2017, they uh, released a report where they found and, and the, they, there were about 18% of those who had died of suicide had opioids, opiates present in their system. Um, they didn't just test for prescription opioids, though. They also tested for fentanyl and carfentanyl, which I know in, in different parts of the country is becoming an increasing concern. 
And they used this data to really help them think through how they could collaborate more effectively with their partners. Right? So they used the National Violent Death Reporting System data that Alex was just talking about, and then did a follow-up test for the presence of opioids. And they were also able to then step back and use this information to help inform the, the drug trafficking information that they had and think about what that meant for how they could reduce the opioid supply, right? So thinking very strategically about kind of how they could collect a little bit more data to make that picture a little bit more whole. And, you know, it, I, right, for some I got the testing all of those suicide deaths for opioids might be with kind of beyond the, the scope of, of kind of what we're able to do financially. But it's just one more way to think a little bit outside the box about how you can collect some more information and how that might actually be able to not just address um, reducing suicide and opioids, but also thinking about reducing the opioid supply. So that's just a brief example from the field on how one state has thought about how can they enhance the data they're collecting and go a little bit deeper, build on that 20 state partnership that you see um, kind of highlighted on your screen in terms of opioid trafficking. And it's, it's, you know, everybody has to do this differently, but I thought that this was, this was a great example. If you're interested in more information, you can see the website is right there on your screen. It's preventoverdoseri.org. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and keep on moving. So with that, I'd now like to hand it over to Dr. Kristen Quinlan, who's gonna help us understand a little bit more about the relationship between suicide and opioids. So Kristen? And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Gisela. Um, so in this next section, I'm going to be exploring the relationship between uh, suicide and opioid abuse. Um, and as you're going to see, it's a complicated relationship that the field's really still unpacking. Um, researchers are still trying to understand the mechanisms that explain the relationship between opioid abuse and suicide, and it hasn't been easy. You're going to see in this next section that our efforts to understand the relationship have been kind of thwarted by some very serious data concerns, and we're going to get to those concerns in just a moment. Um, first, I want to take a look at some national data on the intersection of prescription drug abuse and suicide uh, before turning specifically to the research. So on this slide here, you see data from the 2016 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, this slide reflects the percentage of adults, so these are folks who are 18 and older, who reported serious thoughts of suicide in the past year. If we compare those with no history of prescription drug abuse to those who have a history of prescription drug abuse, we see a pattern. We see that those who have abused prescription drugs are at a higher risk for suicidal thoughts. And this is true every year from 2011 all the way through to 2016. This is actually um, a similar information, but from CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, through 2015. This time the slide reflects the percentage of children, so these would be uh, youth in grades 9 through 12, who reported serious thoughts of suicide in the past year. Again, if we compare those with no history of prescription drug abuse, uh, to those with a history of prescription drug abuse, we see that same pattern that we saw for adults. Those, those who have abused prescription drugs are at higher risk for suicidal thoughts. And again, this holds true every year, 2009, you know, all the way through. So now that we've seen some of the national data on both the slides I just presented and the, the ones that Alex did earlier, um, I want to take a look at some of the, the research. And, and I think it's important to turn to the research literature because it really lets us explore some of the nuances of the relationship. So we can explore questions about whether the dose or the frequency of opioid abuse impacts its relationship to suicide and other like complicated questions like that that move us beyond these kind of general, general associations. Um, so if we look at the research literature, we see that adults who receive high doses of opioids are at increased risk for suicide. Um, and this study cited here on the first bullet um, of the slide is looking specifically at VA patients. Um, this relationship between higher doses of opioids and increased risk of suicide holds true even after controlling for demographic and clinical factors. So the relationship between higher doses of opioids 
an increased risk of suicide is still true regardless of the demographics of the patient and regardless of the, whether or not the patient has a history of or a current um, diagnosis of depression or anxiety. The relationship between opioid abuse at lower levels, so this is less than weekly, um, and suicide can mostly be accounted for by demographics and psychiatric conditions. So once we control for those things, um, things like depression um, or demographics, the relationship between opioid misuse and suicide really falls away. Um, however, if we start looking at adults who abuse um, opioids weekly or more, so the more frequent users, we see they're at higher risk for suicide planning and attempts, and this holds true even after we control for things like depression and other psychiatric conditions. And the third bullet on the slide here comes from uh, a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is a study that combines the results of, of several different studies. And this particular meta-analysis found that adults who have an opioid use disorder are 13 times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. And I think we can draw a theme um, from all three of these bullets here. And, and what they have in common is that the degree of opioid involvement matters. Uh, people who abuse opioids frequently or who use them at higher doses or who have an opioid use disorder appear to be at particularly high suicide risk. So this is where I want to kind of get into the mechanisms um, through which opioid abuse and suicide are related. Um, there's, there could be a lot of explanations for the relationship between opioid abuse and suicide. So maybe higher doses of opioids offer increased access to lethal means. They're available in folks' medicine cabinets, and, and that explains the link. Um, maybe opioids have some kind of disinhibiting effect. So, you know, they increase the likelihood that a person can or will act on their suicidal impulses. Or maybe people who take higher opioid doses share characteristics that explain the link with suicide kind of in other ways. So, for example, um, research tells us that people with a history of depression are actually more likely to receive prescription opiates for pain, and they're more likely to receive them in higher doses and with a greater day supply um, so it, it, than when you compare them with people, to people without a depression diagnosis. So maybe this is you know, where, the, where the explanation is. Um, and any of those, those hypotheses are actually you know, a possibility or, or even a combination of, the hypo of these hypotheses are really entirely possible. I think the take home point here is really that the relationship between opioid abuse and suicide is complicated and the explanatory mechanisms um, for, for understanding that relationship are, are not really well understood. So understanding the relationship between opioid abuse and, and suicide is made even more complex by some inconsistencies and limitations in our death data. Uh, when classifying a death as a suicide, a coroner or a medical examiner has to determine two things. They have to determine if the person knew that the dose was likely to be lethal. Did they have enough experience with or knowledge of the substance to really understand its effects? And what was the person's intent? And this intent question is one of the more challenging aspects of our opioid suicide death data. Was this an intentional suicide by opioid poisoning, or was this an unintentional opioid overdose? And the issue is that intent is really left up to coroners and medical examiners who might have their own biases or opinions about what constitutes level of intent. Um, so coroners and medical examiners are, are left to determine where on this intentionality continuum a death might fall. Um, and this is complicated because sometimes even the decedent might not truly understand his or her own intent. And so it's, it's very challenging for you know, coroners or medical examiners uh, who find themselves in that situation. So as a result, you know, medical examiners and coroner systems are just challenged. Um, these are the categories they have to choose from on a death certificate um, listed here on this slide. Uh, and clearly, the last four represent that overdose suicide intentionality continuum that you saw on the last slide. We have cases of clear suicide and cases of clear accident, but sometimes intent isn't known. And we need to make sure that medical examiners and coroner systems are being systematic in their selection of manner in death and not inadvertently biased about selecting some cases as a suicide, some as an accident, and some as undetermined. On this slide, we have a summary of some of the common challenges that medical examiners and coroners are, are facing when they're trying to classify a, a poisoning death. Um, first, they're met with some scarce resources and inadequate training opportunities. Coroners in some states are elected officials. Um, they might not have any medical training, um, and some states don't have any policies regarding requirements for any kind of ongoing training. So when something pops up, like the opioid crisis, coroners and medical examiners are sort of left scrambling. Um, you know, they may or may not have the, the resources or the training uh, to, to really adequately you know, address it and understand all the nuances associated with it. 
There's the issue of punitive policies. Um, so some insurance policies might have punitive policies, um, meaning that if a decedent, you know, took out a um, a uh, uh, insurance uh, policy just before their, their death, for example, um, if it was a suicide, it might not be paid out. Coroners and medical examiners know this, um, and this might come into their manner of death selection. Uh, we also have a, a bias that's produced by knowledge of existing trends. The opioid crisis is really everywhere. So it's on the news, it's in our everyday conversations, and, and medical examiners and coroners are operating in this context. So they might hear the word opioid death, and, and they may not necessarily be thinking about suicide. Uh, there's also the issue of stigma and cultural opinions. Uh, coroners and medical examiners might face some political pressures uh, not to classify a death as a suicide because of stigma. They might have some ideas about what they think a suicide looks like. Um, it might not look so closely at classifying a death as a suicide if it doesn't contain very specific characteristics, like a note, or if they're using a more um, passive method of death over a more active manner of death. So a gunshot wound or a hanging being more likely to be classified as a suicide than an opioid overdose. We also have those complexities around determining intent, which I um, sort of covered already. And I think the issue of intent, um, along with the issues that are identified on the last slide, uh, mean that the undercounting of suicide is a potential problem um, when, we, when we start thinking about overdose deaths. And I think the bigger problem is that the undercounting might not be random. Um, if it were random, we would expect that all populations were affected equally by the non-random undercounting. And while this would be a problem because it would lead us to think that you know, suicide was maybe not happening as often as it truly was, um, it's not, you know, sort of disproportionately selecting some groups over others. The non-random undercounting of suicide means that means just that that the that the suicide undercounting is non-random. So for those who are interested in this issue, I think um, if you read Ian Rocket's work, um, he's very specifically focused on this issue. He's uh, from West Virginia University, and he's found that um, specific groups might be more affected than other groups by the undercounting of suicide. The characteristics you see listed here on the slide, um, minority race, ethnicity, younger age, lower levels of education, lack of history of psychiatric comorbidity, um, and a lack of a suicide note, indicate those people who are more likely to be placed in that category of injury of undetermined intent, um, and therefore at risk for a possible misclassification of suicide. So there's some suspicion that the, that the, non that the undercounting of suicide is in fact non-random. Um, not included on this slide is, is some more research that indicates that more active modes of injury, like gunshots or hanging, are more likely to be classified as suicides than less active modes of injury, like poisoning through overdose. And I think the take-home point here is that there's a lot of gray area in classifying overdose deaths, and that gray area means that some groups might be at higher risk of misclassification than others. And that's really important when we're thinking about using this data for where we're directing our prevention resources, because the data may be leading us in, you know, a different direction uh, than is actually happening on the ground. Um, I think importantly, we want to turn and think about, about tribes, um, because when we think about tribes, we have all of the same concerns we just covered in the prior slides, but we also have a few more. For some tribal communities, there are concerns about the power of words and language. The term suicide might be outside of their cultural and religious lexicon. Um, so the cultural concept of suicide might not really exist for some tribes, which makes it awfully difficult to count. Because tribes have historically been disenfranchised, um, they may be really protective about their community um, and worried about what their data might be used for um, if they were to share it more broadly. Tribes might be collecting data in ways that are different from each other um, and different from the systems that have been developed by the federal government. So this means that in some cases, uh, you know, data may not be available for, you know, certain, certain tribes or certain groups. Um, and again, I just want to underscore this point that the undercounting of suicide really matters. It matters for tribes. It matters for other populations. We use this data for planning um, and for making the case for prevention dollars. Um, and we also use it for evaluating our um, prevention efforts. And inaccurate data could seriously impact our prevention work. Um, so what I want to do next is turn to Gazela to talk about um, examples and implications. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. That was an awful lot of information.
I actually, um, I would love to, before we talk a little bit more about this example from Kentucky, I want to take a step back um, and actually pose a question to Dr. Richard McKeon, who, who you all heard earlier during the webinar. Um, and Dr. McKeon, so Kristen talked about the challenges related to undercounting. And I'm wondering whether, since you have a, a very national perspective on this, you could say a little bit about why that is problematic from a national perspective. And if you could maybe give an example of how you've seen that being addressed, either through the form of a collaboration or in some other form. Well, I think the undercounting is problematic, and for a number of different reasons, one of which is that it minimizes the attention being given to the steadily increasing rates of suicide in the United States, and the undercounting means that it's worse than it appears um, even in the national statistics, you know, which are of concern concerning enough. And, you know, the example was given about how that you know, one thing that's utilized is the presence of a suicide note. When there's a suicide note there, then we know that it's a suicide. But there are a couple, there are a couple of issues associated with that. One is, and I think Alex would know this better than I, but I think, I think it's no more than one in three suicide deaths actually have a suicide note. So the idea that a suicide is invariably associated with a suicide note is inaccurate. And how to determine that, of course, it is, it is challenging. And I think we see the same challenge when we look at non-fatal overdoses. And you think about all the people who present to emergency rooms either after a suicide attempt or a non-intentional overdose. And the reality is until somebody sits down and talks to the person, they're not going to be able to make a determination about whether it was a suicide attempt or it was an accidental overdose. And that's important. And there may be some instances where even the person themselves may not be clear about what their intentions were. You know, so, uh, you know, because of, 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 of this, and this fits in with why we're doing these webinars on this topic, it's really important for us to be aware of the importance of collaborating and working together. So, for example, those who have made non-fatal overdoses, whether they're intentional or not, being seen in emergency departments, all of them, regardless of whether it was a suicide attempt or not, will require rapid follow-up and linkage to care, regardless of whether it was intentional or not. And each of them needs to have a careful assessment in the emergency room by staff who are familiar with, with uh, both suicide as well as uh, the opioid uh, uh, epidemic and other uh, substance use related issues. So, th so those are some thoughts around that. That's super helpful. Thank you for that. Kristen, I actually want to throw another question at you. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions around the, the de definition of opioid abuse. Can you say a little bit about that? Is it related to DSM-5, or is there another definition that, that you are looking at here? So when we're talking about opioid abuse, it depends on the survey um, in which we're referencing. So different surveys um, refer to it in different ways. Um, for some folks, it, is, it involves um, the use of um, prescription drugs that were, you know, not prescribed to you um, or the use of uh, prescription drugs uh, in a manner that, that, that is, you know, not as what was indicated by the doctor or, you know, the use of someone else's uh, prescription or the use of prescription um, in amount that's different than what was prescribed. So there's a whole host of different ways um, in which it can be defined and sometimes it's defined, you know, with, with all of those. Also within the surveys, you know, they, some surveys ask about, you know, lifetime. Have you ever done this in, in, you know, in the course of your life? Others will look at, you know, past year. Um, you know, have you, have you abused prescription drugs in the past year? So the definition really depends on the source. Um, and so, you know, depending on, on that, that would be, you know, how you define it. Great. That's helpful. And then to, to kind of circle around to kind of the other, the other side of the question, which is you reference the question of a high dose of opioids being at an increased risk for suicide. Can, can you define high dose a bit? Yeah, so I, I 
cannot um, at this time, but um, actually I can refer back. <laughs> I can refer back to the to the research. Um, there's a citation on that slide, um, and I can pull that for you. Um, so I don't know what that particular um, research study cited as a high dose, but often, you know, in this research, in this type of research, they um, refer to high dose also, you know, higher number of prescribed days, so the longer sort of length of prescription. There's a whole host of different variables that they use to define sort of access to opioids in general. Great. Perfect. Thank you. So we will loop back around on that one. Alex, I'm wondering if I can also pitch one more question to you before I start with my so what implications. We got a question around mandated screening. So is there a suicide risk screening that is mandated for providers who prescribe opioids? Would you happen to know the answer to that question off the top of your head? Uh, this is Alex. I, I don't think there are standardized protocols for that or mandates for that across the board. You know, so for all providers um, that would provide opioids, I don't think there is a mandate for that. One of the things to mention in that regard is um, there was a, a recent uh, review by the uh, Guide for Clinical Preventive Services, and one of the things they found is that there wasn't solid enough evidence for some of the screening tools that were available at the time. Now, this was you know, a couple of years ago, and I know they're going to try to uh, review that. But some of the screening tools did not provide uh, enough evidence for action by the providers or, you know, in some cases, the infrastructure wasn't available. If you identify somebody that you know, screens positive, what is the follow-up? You know, is there uh, an in-person interview? Is there standardized treatment? Is there availability of treatment for folks? So, at that point, there was insufficient evidence when the, the clinical guide, you know, put together uh, a systematic review of all the evidence uh, that had been published at the time. Great. That is really helpful. I want to go ahead and, and kind of loop back around the implications for practice and think a little bit about, you know, what we as suicide and substance abuse prevention practitioners can do to help address this issue. And I guess an extra note to say that, you know, as Kristen alluded to, the stigma around both overdose and suicide is huge, right, as public health problems. The very, um, I think stigma is something that we all should be thinking about. So we have to think about that as we start to move forward. And I think actually some of the questions about how do you engage people uh, around this topic kind of get at, like, how do we overcome this stigma? We don't have a ton of time to talk about that today, but I do want to make sure it's, it's kind of in folks' minds. And we can, we can go ahead and, and loop back to that in a bit. Um, but a few things, right? So once we've identified who's being impacted or affected in our community, we want to think about what's happening in our community that puts some populations at higher risk than others at certain times, and how can we ensure that we're really being intentional about knowing who's being in, impacted and why and ensuring that we know that cultural context. I think this is one of the reasons that community level folks are often the uh, most appropriate to be thinking about how to engage in this because we understand the, the community context in which we operate. Secondly, we want to be thinking about engaging those key stakeholders uh, to understand their classification practices. And I think Alex got kind of referred to this in his earlier comments around engaging the coroners and the medical examiners to really understand what their classification practices are. We do know that the CDC is pulling together a, a, a guidance document based on some workshopping and work groups of key stakeholders that they've, they've been working on that will have some tools that will provide some support to both standardize, to develop kind of standardized classification. So that, that will be a tool that will be forthcoming that would be really helpful for these, uh, you know, especially the coroners and the medical examiners. Um, and then we want to make sure we identify others who in our region who are addressing this issue. And this is, you know, I think Alex uh, alluded to this earlier when he was talking about the organizations who are providing practices. We often think about this at the community level, but understanding that regionally this is also incredibly important um, because I know many of us don't live in communities where all of the services are easily accessible, you know, right within those geographic bounds. So 
thinking about that and making sure that we are thinking about who else we should be tapping into. You know, I know when I worked at the community level, I was always kind of reaching out to my partners in different communities who I knew had different experiences and access to different resources. And so kind of thinking very strategically about that is really important. So with that, I want to move us along to another example from the field. This time, I uh, want to be highlighting some work being done in Kentucky. So in Kentucky, in addition to uh, having some standardized crime scene tools, they're also thinking very strategically and connecting people who overdose and end up at the emergency room with a peer support recovery specialist who also happens to be trained in suicide prevention specific kind of evidence-based programs. So I believe in this case we're talking about QPR um, and assist. And, and, and we know just you know we know that not everyone who overdoses ends up calling 911 but I think that this example specifically highlights how someone can access more services and why it's so important uh, to, to think strategically about how we can do some of that cross-pollinization the this in this particular case, this collaboration has really helped the state think about um, and have improved accuracy in suicide and opioid overdose data. And they've thought about how they can address suicide risk and overdose risk simultaneously or concurrently. That is also incredibly important. So, you know, if, if you have peer support recovery specialists in your emergency rooms and you're able to link them with some resources uh, for suicide prevention, that really kind of helps to, to, think, to, to collaborate and start some interventions at that community level. In order to keep us on time, I am going to keep us moving since we just finished answering a few questions. Um, and we are going to move on now to thinking uh, about so opioid abuse and suicide and what we know about specific risk factors. Um, this will be our last section today. And again, we'll come back around at the, at the end of this section to talk about some practical implications and answer some questions and give you another case example. But for now, I want to hand it back over to Kristen, who's going to help us understand a little bit more about these risk factors. Great. Thank you, Gazela. Um, so as Gazela mentions, on the next couple of slides, I want to talk about the factors that increase risk for opioid abuse um, and factors that increase the risk for suicide. Um, and then I want to look at the overlap together. So we'll see what risk factors these two public health issues have in common. And I want to talk about how an understanding of shared risk factors can really help us in our prevention work. So let's turn first to the factors that increase risk for opioid abuse. Um, and I want to flag first physical health problems and pain. Um, I saw that come up a couple of times as a question in the chat on the relationship of, of opioid abuse um, to pain. And we're going to be covering that relationship between pain and opioids in a greater detail um, in, our, in our next webinar. Uh, but for now, I just want to flag the fact that pain patients, uh, particularly those with a greater supply of pain medication, uh, could be at higher risk for opioid abuse and dependence. And the relationship can really be magnified if there's a history of trauma or a prior history of substance abuse. So pain patients with a trauma history or with a sub substance abuse history are at even higher risk of opioid abuse. Um, I also want to flag behavioral health problems here on the slide. Uh, depression and anxiety are very well studied um, risk factors for opioid abuse. Um, they've been studied as a risk factor for both adults um, and uh, youth as well. And interestingly, we can actually tie the risk factor of depression and anxiety and behavioral health problems back to that issue of chronic pain, um, because chronic pain patients are at higher risk for depression, um, and they're also at higher risk for opioid abuse. So the risk factors that we see here on the slide are not isolated risk factors. They're actually linked together um, with one another. I also want to flag trauma as a risk factor. Uh, trauma, um, which some researchers have defined as, as childhood abuse and neglect, um, has also been directly associated with an increased risk of prescription opioid misuse in early adulthood. Some researchers suggest that this connection can be mediated by the experience of pain. So um, pain plays a really important role in, in understanding that connection between child abuse and neglect and opioid misuse. Again, just flagging that factor that you know, these are not isolated risk factors. They are, they are interconnected. I also want to look at social isolation. Rural environments, which some researchers have used as a proxy for social isolation, have been associated with prescription um, opioid misuse, um, particularly for white adolescents. 
Uh, if we look specifically at measures of social isolation in drug use, we see that for adolescents, the risk of drug use increases with loneliness. So there's some research out of Colorado State that kind of tiers in terms of risk factors um, in different types of adolescents. So youth who don't have any drug-using friends but who have a lot of friends um, are the least likely to participate in drug use or abuse, while lonely youth um, and youth with many drug-using friends are more likely to abuse drugs. So this research isn't really opioid-specific, but it does really speak to that vulnerability of loneliness um, as a risk factor for, for drug abuse. And I definitely do not want to leave this slide without talking about the difference between causation and correlation. The factors on this slide increase uh, the risk, they, they show increased risk of opioid abuse, but they don't guarantee it. So even if a person were to have every single risk factor on this slide, it doesn't mean they will abuse opioids. Uh, opioid abuse is not necessarily caused by any one of these risk factors, um, and these risk factors have very complicated relationships, um, even with one another. So I want to really underscore that fact, that these relationships are complicated um, and they're not causational. On this next slide, I want to talk about the risk factors for suicide. Um, if you're looking for a really nice summary of some of the risk factors associated with suicide, you might want to turn to the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. And the link to the National Strategy can be found in handout number two, um, which you see here on the slide, um, and also in the bottom left-hand corner of our, um, of our presenting uh, chat pod here. And I've highlighted a few of the risk factors that, you know, that can be found in uh, the National Strategy here on the slide as well. I want to flag first physical health problems and pain. Uh, cancers, uh, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's or uh, multiple sclerosis, traumatic injury, um, and chronic pain conditions like headache and back pain are all associated with suicide risk. I want to highlight social isolation as another well-established risk factor for suicide, particularly for adolescents. If we look at some work out of the University of Minnesota, we see uh, some, uh, some clear associations between social isolation and suicide attempts. In the specific research that I'm thinking of, they actually defined social isolation as having fewer than one friend. So youth who kind of endorsed that, that risk factor um, were also at higher risk for suicide attempts. I also want to turn to trauma and highlight that here on the slide. Research has shown a positive correlation between the number of adverse childhood events, or ACEs, um, and future suicide risk. We also know that historical trauma seems to be associated with future suicide risk, and we've seen that in Native American and Alaskan Native populations. Again, I want to underscore this idea that correlation doesn't equal causation. So the factors on this slide are associated with suicide, but the relationship to suicide is complicated. And if we think about this slide and the slide before it, we can see that there are some commonalities between those factors that place people at risk for opioid misuse and those factors that place people at risk for suicide. Specifically, we see that physical health problems, behavioral health problems, trauma and adverse childhood experiences and social isolation are all associated with both opioid abuse and suicidality. There's some intersection there. And I think that as prevention practitioners, it's important to think about what we can do to address suicide and opioid abuse because of that clear intersection. So we might want to think about implementing strategies and programs that really target those areas of intersection. Um, there are a few ways we could go about this. So, for example, we could move upstream a bit. Maybe we could target those shared risk and protective factors early. So we look at strategies that reduce social isolation, for example. Or we can think about those shared risk factors as a way to provide targeted supports. So if we know that adults with chronic pain are at high risk for suicide and opioid use, for example, we make sure that people who encounter adults experiencing pain, like those who work at pain clinics or through home visiting programs, are really well prepared to do appropriate screening and referrals for both suicide and opioid abuse. And substance abuse and preventionists and suicide preventionists have a lot in common. Um, one of those commonalities is that there's never enough funding for all of the prevention work that we need to do. And so joining forces really helps all of us. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, it focuses on those at highest risk. It avoids the duplication of effort. It provides good value for our prevention dollars. Um, and on this slide, too, I want to ha highlight handout number three. I think individually, suicide prevention and substance abuse prevention have generated a lot of really good resources 
but suicide preventionists might not be aware of some of the resources from substance abuse prevention and vice versa. Um, one of the reasons I was really excited to do this webinar is because we've really targeted both audiences. Um, on the line here, we have suicide preventionists, we have substance abuse preventionists, and I'm really excited to see handout number three because it highlights the good work of both fields. It's a nice opportunity for both fields to learn about, you know, what the other is doing uh, so we can, we can increase collaboration. Um, I want to turn things back to Gazela so she can talk about some real-world examples um, applying things and implications. Perfect. Thank you, Kristen. And I, I know a couple of you had questions around uh, specific strategies and uh, encouraging collaboration. And hopefully, the two handouts that Kristen just alluded to will help you help kind of get you on your way. There are definitely a lot of really helpful pieces in there. And I'll just highlight, I know we've gotten a few questions specifically around um, working with tribal populations. And um, just to highlight that there is actually a tool in, in handout number two that that's geared towards working with tribal populations called Cultural Approaches to Prevention. So I encourage you to take a look at that. But for now, I'm going to, again, think about some so what implications all right, so based on what Kristen just shared with us, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about and what, what implications for those of us working at the community level does all of this have? Again, we're, we're really talking a lot today about data and making sure we capture data around the, the means of suicide and, and making sure that the population that are at highest risk are being captured effectively. The importance of understanding who is at risk cannot be underscored, um, and the means by which they, they are committing suicide is really important. And understanding this, again, is the key to being able to link to evidence-based strategies to ensure that the, the efforts that we put in place are going to be um, as effective as possible to help us get those outcomes that we are looking at. Then again, focusing on, on engaging those new partners who can both identify and implement innovative strategies to address uh, both, pro both overdose and uh, suicide are really important, right? Um, thinking about perhaps are there pain management centers in your community or other sectors who can help with something like a prescription drug uh, disposal strategy? Is that possible? I think that you know, those are the kinds of things that, that we can be talking about. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about chronic pain specifically um, on the next webinar. But um, you can be thinking about some of these other folks uh, and partners in your community beyond uh, medical examiners and coroners who can, who can help about. Um, then there's this question of, does it make sense to pull together a special task force to address this intersection of suicide and opioid abuse? You know, the idea of building new partnerships and, and help to address stigma, this is a perfect place where you can also engage, you know, folks who are either in recovery from opioid use disorder or who may be using illicit drugs actively. I know we've, we've presented some data around uh, prescription opioids specifically and, and how that's related to risk, but of course there is this piece around, you know, folks who are using illicit opioids also being at risk. Um, and while we may not have called that out specifically, that is certainly um, a, a part of this conversation. The data is a little harder to get sometimes, but again, if you are able to do those posts, those posts suicide autopsies, you're, you can find out what kind of um, opioids may be present in the system. And, a, and again, the, the special task force in this particular case um, can help you bring together the, the various folks who will know the most about these populations. And then finally, the, this issue of stigma, and I've brought this up before today, but understanding yourself the, the stigma that's facing the populations abusing and, and misusing opioids and those who are at a higher risk for um, suicide is really important. And as you know, prevention practitioners, finding ways to talk about this in our communities in a way that is both understanding and compassionate for all those involved is incredibly important. And, and by talking about it and doing so compassionately, you know, we can help to start kind of take down or, or break down some of that stigma by being careful about the, the language that we use, which is something, you know, we, we constantly have to be thinking about and we have to be adjusting. And, and I think you've, he you've heard us do that today a little bit during this webinar, kind of, you know, going back and forth between language. It's, it's a process and it's not easy, but I think that we as prevention practitioners, whether working on the suicide 
side or the substance abuse side, we have the opportunity to go ahead and, and you know, start having some of those conversations. So that's kind of a few implications for practice that we wanted to highlight. Um, again, I wanted to land on um, one more example from the field, and this one's from Connecticut. And the reason we opted to, to kind of highlight Connecticut here is because of some of the work that they have been doing to build an infrastructure within the state where they really are able to address that intersection of, of overdose and suicide. So over the last 10 years, Connecticut's actually been building up their infrastructure with both their suicide prevention grants, their substance abuse prevention grants, to really seek to in integrate the substance abuse prevention, the suicide prevention, and actually the mental health promotion efforts that are happening across the state. They've kind of gone beyond just going statewide and then gone down to regional levels and looked at uh, integrating the regional boards of health and the substance abuse prevention councils, making sure those are integrated and working together so that there aren't separate entities uh, doing this work kind of across the board and really looking at making sure that they're all kind of, you know, singing the same tune, if you will. This has also allowed them to actually address access to lethal means, both in healthcare areas as well as within universities. They have been working hard to reduce the stigma against access to naloxone and using naloxone to reverse overdoses. They've also been able to kind of share the detrimental impact on family and loved ones when suicides are misclassified as opioid overdoses. Um, that, was, that was something that, that really came up as being really important for them. And kind of landed in this place where, you know, the more people know and understand and the more people were at the table, they found the better and greater the questions being asked of the state to effectively address this, both the issues of overdose and suicide and their, uh, their intersection, right? So the more people you have at the, the table, um, the, the harder the questions that get asked sometimes. And that helps to, to push us all to get clarity on where we're going and, and what kinds of things we need to be thinking about. So I want to wrap that up there. Um, I hope that that was a helpful example for all of you. We do have some time for questions, and I'm actually going to go ahead and kind of go back a little bit. Because we had a question from a participant around psychological autopsies. And Kristen, I'm wondering if I could pull you in here the, the question is, is there any evidence that psychological autopsies improve data collection? And I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts on that. I do. Um, so for those who are not familiar with psychological autopsies, some states have child death review committees. Um, and child death review committees will actually um, look at uh, the death of, of, of children um, and kind of do investigation, psychological autopsies, if you will, speaking to parents, you know, uh, no, other family members, friends, providers, uh, to figure out, you know, what systems they touched prior to their death, um, you know, and, and other, you know, just, just to get a, a good sense of, you know, the kinds of, of issues that the child might have been dealing with prior to, the, to their death. Some states also have suicide fatality committees um, that do uh, similar things um, but for suicides. The question with regard to psychological autopsies led me to think about um, Nate Wright's work out of the University of Minnesota. Nate Wright is an epidemiologist who is uh, working with psychological autopsies specifically for tribal populations. And so what Nate Wright did is he looked at um, all of the deaths of, by overdose of Native American individuals in, in Minnesota and classified those deaths as, you know, using, using the manner of death uh, that sent a uh, uh, classification by the um, coroner um, to, to say, okay, well, was it a definite suicide, as in, you know, it was classified as a suicide by the coroner? Was it a possible suicide? Was it a probable suicide? Or was it an accidental overdose? And he sort of classified all of the deaths of Native American folks um, who died by overdose in this way. Um, and in doing so, he actually found that the rate of suicide um, or, or misclassification of suicide looks to be about 28% um, in Minnesota. So the possible misclassification of suicide for 
for um, Native American populations um, in Minnesota is about 28% um, for overdose deaths. And, and that seems important um, and also relevant to some of the work that um, we've seen come out of, of um, emergency departments and, and reviews uh, that suggest that the rate of opioid overdose deaths is, is misclassifications is somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. And so certainly uh, psychological autopsies, which really seek to gather more information about um, the, the decedent and you know, all the circumstances surrounding their death um, and can sometimes challenge the manner of death classification by the coroner or medical examiner, are certainly important tools in understanding you know, that, that misclassification issue. That is super helpful. Thank you for having that at your fingertips, Kristen. There's also a question, and Kristen, Alex, I'm not sure which one of you might be the best to answer this question, but we've gotten a couple of questions around HIPAA and whether HIPAA is a barrier to building a more clear picture of the intersection of opioid abuse and suicide. Alex, I'm wondering if that might be up your alley. Um, there, there are some places in which uh, HIPAA may be involved with uh, public health surveillance data, um, oftentimes especially in, in response to uh, health departments. Um, there are some, I guess I would call it exceptions, that health departments can collect information about that for the use in developing prevention or intervention activities. So there are some places in which, you know, certain organizations, especially state or local health departments, can collect information uh, about individuals when they need that information uh, to develop programs. There may be some restrictions on HIPAA, especially individuals trying to get other individuals kind of information, but um, there are some ways in which you can uh, work with that. There are also opportunities, you know, whether that's, you know, working with hospitals or, or working with, uh, you know, inpatient or emergency department data in which the, the hospitals may be able to share aggregate data, you know, in which they take off personal identifiers, but put together, you know, some of the information that may be related to risk factors or, you know, mechanisms that were used or even, you know, in some cases, substances that were used, but there's no personal identifiers on it. So there are ways in which, uh, you know, data can be shared. It's, it's oftentimes a matter of working with those organizations, finding out you know, what their comfort is. You know, sometimes you do have to work through, uh, you know, some of their Office of General Counsel, but there are ways in which uh, some of that data can be shared. Again, you know, what is the purpose of it? You know, are we trying to work towards intervention and trying to uh, prevent uh, these adverse conditions occurring in the community? Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Alex. That's super helpful. And Kristen, I think I'm going to lodge the, the, probably the final question that we can take today to you, which is kind of a follow-up question, really. Um, you know, I imagine in a lot of our communities or even kind of smaller uh, regions, counties, we might be looking at relatively small numbers of overdose and suicide. And especially then when we try to get down to identifying specific populations that this is impacting, we can get some really small numbers. And there are some best practices and guidance around not reporting, I, I guess I would call it surveillance data, um, on, on too small a numbers. Could you say a word or two about some of the, the ways that, you know, as an epidemiologist, you kind of, some best practices you might kind of lay, lay out for folks to be thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. So um, if I think about, I guess as you're speaking, I was thinking about small numbers in, in Montana, for example. In Montana, their um, state suicide prevention uh, person at the state level um, has actually trained himself to be a coroner, and he reviews all of the death certificates um, that, you know, that were suicides and kind of does his own um, sort of psychological autopsy. And, and they can do that um, because, you know, the ends are small. But but those small ends mean, you know, there's identifiers, there's accidental identifiers. So the release of information can actually lead you to be able to inadvertently identify a person. And this is a, you know, a problem in small communities, those very rural communities. It's a problem for, for tribal populations. Um, one of the reasons why they don't want their, you know, in some cases, tribal communities are, are a little concerned about, you know, having their data shared um, because those small ends lead to accidental identifiers. And so there's some nice, you know, I think best practices when it comes to dealing with small ends 
I'm calling them small ends, I'm sorry, small numbers of folks. And I think, first of all, you, you need to consider the use of data that includes small ends. So it's very hard to interpret trend data um, and things like that if your end is, is in fact too small. So you want to think about whether or not your end is even appropriate uh, for analysis. You also want to um, think about the way in which you break down your data. So when you're breaking down your data, you know, if breaking it down by race, ethnicity, for example, leads you to a too small end, think about working it back up and, and not breaking it down according to certain characteristics that might lead to unintentional identifiers. When you're doing your data agreements uh, with different groups, when you're working with your partners, you want to think about kind of setting those uh, specifications up front so you and your, and your partners have a sense of, you know, at which point you're going to suppress the data so you're not going to kind of report it out um, so that way those inadvertent identifiers are, are not available. And so those are some of the best practices with regard to, to small ends. Um, I also think that, you know, when we talk about what small ends can be used for. Um, they are useful when we're thinking about psychological autopsies, when we're thinking about systems that, that folks have touched, when we're thinking about quality improvement. Um, so really dealing with, you know, when you've got a small end, it's important to, to dig. Um, if you have access to individually, you know, um, identifiable data, not for sharing purposes, but for understanding where in the system, you know, folks are touching possible places for intervention. That's a lot to think about, um, but thank you. And I think that that also kind of highlights for us, again, making sure that we are addressing the appropriate public health pro uh, problems in, in our own communities. So thank you so much for that. And looking at the time, I see that we really need to wrap up. So I'm going to zip through our summary um, and encourage folks to ask any other follow-up questions. If we didn't get to your question, we promise we've, we have it logged and we will do some follow-up. But just to summarize kind of where we've been today, suicide and opioid abuse and overdose rates have grown over the past decade. Uh, the relationship between these health problems is complex and much is still unknown because that data is limited, which, which Kristen just kind of reemphasized for us. Collaboration is key um, and including efforts to address shared risk factors is incredibly important. And we want to just make sure that uh, we're, we're thinking appropriately about collaborating with the appropriate entities and making sure that we are really thinking strategically about that. So with that, well, I really appreciate everyone hanging in there with us today. We know there is a lot of material, um, but I would like to hand it back over to uh, Dr. Richard McKeon. At this Thank you. So again, I just want to underscore that there are resources that are available to you currently from the CAPT, and you can see them in, in front of you on addressing opioid overdose and working to reduce the flow of prescribed opiates and preventing prescription drug misuse. All of those can be quite valuable, as well as from the SPRC, including those that uh, assist in terms of suicide prevention in American Indian Alaska Native settings. And one that you see pictured in front of you, we mentioned the importance of emergency departments. This is on caring for adult patients uh, with suicide risk. And uh, from our partners at the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General and the Action Alliance and at the CDC, so the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, and CDC's Preventing Suicide, a Technical Package of Policies, Programs, and Practices, which it, it provides support for a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention, which is what is likely needed for us to reduce suicide in states and communities across the country. And, and let me just mention one other thing in, in terms of the important overlap between these, these issues. It's important to be aware that they, they are similar, not only in terms of the behavior that's involved, I mean, someone who takes an overdose, the exact same behavior, whether it is intentional or non-intentional, but also sometimes in the emotions that underlie it, and that these, these are deaths and, and injuries that um, have as underlying them despair. Um, um, and the Nobel Prize winning Princeton economist case in Deaton have written about what they can call the deaths of despair and their increase in the U.S. opioid overdoses, suicides, uh, alcohol-involved liver disease. And so there are some very important connections for us to be uh, aware of um, and to continue to, to work together 
um, into the future. So we'll look forward to being able to engage with you around that. I would now like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Carol McHale, to close us out. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, everyone. Thank you again to our presenters today, Alex Crosby, Kristen Quinlan, and Gazela Ross. And thank you, participants, for joining us today uh, to explore these important intersections of opioid abuse, overdose, and suicide. This concludes our SAMHSA webinar event for today.